Chapter thirty two of the Hoosier Schoolmaster by Edward Eggleston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter thirty two. After the battle. Nothing can be more demoralizing in the long run than lynch law. And yet, lynch law often originates in a burst of generous indignation which is not willing to suffer a bold oppressor to escape by means of corrupt and cowardly courts. It is oftener born of fear. Both motives powerfully agitated the people of the region round about Clifty, as night drew on after Rolf's acquittal. They were justly indignant that Rolf had been made the victim of such a conspiracy, and they were frightened at the unseen danger to the community from such a band as that of Smalls. It was certain that they did not know the full extent of the danger as yet, and what Small might do with the jury, or what Pete Jones might do with the sheriff, was a question. I must not detain the reader to tell how the mob rose. Nobody knows how such things come about. Their origin is as inexplicable as that of an earthquake. But, at any rate, a rope was twice put round Small's neck during that night, and both times Small was saved only by the nerve and address of Rolf, who had learned how unjust mob law may be. As for Small, he neither trembled when they were ready to hang him, nor looked relieved when he was saved nor showed the slightest flush of penitence or gratitude. He bore himself in a quiet, gentlemanly way throughout, like the admirable villain that he was. He waived a preliminary examination the next day. His father went his bail, and he forfeited bail and disappeared from the county and from the horizon of my story. Two reports concerning Small have been in circulation. One, that he was running a faro bank in San Francisco, the other that he was curing consumption in New York by some quack process. If this latter were true, it would leave it an open question whether Rolf did well to save him from the gallows. Pete Jones and Bill, as usually happens to the rougher villains, went to prison, and when their terms had expired, moved to Pike County, Missouri. But it is about Hannah that you wish to hear, and that I wish to tell. She went straight from the courtroom to Flat Creek, climbed to her chamber, packed in a handkerchief all her earthly goods, consisting chiefly of a few family relics, and turned her back on the house of means forever. At the gate she met the old woman, who shook her fist in the girl's face and gave her a parting benediction in the words, "'You miserable, ungrateful critter, you! Go long! I'm glad to be shed of you!' At the barn she met Bud, and he told her good-bye with a little huskiness in his voice, while a tear glistened in her eyes. Bud had been a friend in need, and such a friend one does not leave without a pang. "'Where are you going? Can I?' "'No, no,' and with that she hastened on, afraid that Bud would offer to hitch up the roan colt, and she did not want to add to his domestic unhappiness by compromising him in that way. It was dusk and was raining when she left. The hours were long, the road was lonely, and after the revelations of that day it did not seem wholly safe. But from the moment that she found herself free her heart had been ready to break with an impatient homesickness. What though there might be robbers in the woods? What though there were ten rough miles to travel? What though the rain was in her face? What though she had not tasted food since the morning of that exciting day? Flat Creek and bondage were behind. Freedom, mother, shockey, and home were before her, and her feet grew lighter with the thought. And if she needed any other joy, it was to know that the master was clear. And he would come? And so she traversed the weary distance. And so she inquired and found the house, the beautiful, homely old house, of beautiful, homely old Nancy Sawyer, and knocked, and was admitted, and fell down, faint and weary, at her blind mother's feet and laid her tired head in her mother's lap, and wept and wept like a child, and said, Oh, mother, I'm free, I'm free, while the mother's tears baptized her face, and the mother's trembling fingers combed out her tresses. And Shockey stood by her and cried, I knowed God wouldn't forget you, Hannah. Hannah was ready now to do anything by which she could support her mother and Shockey. She was strong, and inured to toil. 
She was willing and cheerful, and she would gladly have gone to service if by that means she could have supported the family. And, for that matter, her mother was already able nearly to support herself by her knitting. But Hannah had been carefully educated when young, and at that moment the old public schools were being organized into a graded school, and the good minister, who shall be nameless, because he is, perhaps, still living in Indiana, and who in Methodist parlance was called the preacher in charge of Lewisburg Station. This good minister, and Miss Nancy Sawyer, got Hannah a place as teacher in the primary department. And then a little house with four rooms was rented, and a little, a very little furniture was put into it, and the old sweet home was established again. The father was gone, never to come back again, but the rest were here, and somehow Hannah kept waiting for somebody else to come. End of chapter 32